Um, so, um, why don't we get started? You look like you're cold there. I mean, here it's really hot. We're having a, we're actually having a heat wave. Would you believe at the moment? It's incredible. So, so where <laughs> Can't are believe you? it. Where, where, I'm in where Australia. I'm in near Sydney, uh, on the road as you go towards Canberra, which would be going south from Sydney. Difficult to feel on the map. I mean, Australia is a huge place. Yeah. Uh, I'm about a hundred, about seventy-five miles south of Sydney. So uh, in a little village, uh, very picturesque, almost British-looking village, um, and uh, I live in a very pretty house. Um, and this is the studio building, which is next door. It's a big barn, and I make all my records here. And um, it's it's just uh, it's lovely. It's idyllic, you know, and uh, a real a real escape. You know, it's like New England, I guess, in the states. You know, it's. I mean, it it's, sounds magic. It's like being out of New York, you know, and being in New England. <laughs> yeah, I'm a New York City guy. You know, I was born yeah, in. Okay, New yeah, I guessed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I guess you could hear it with the accent. Um, no, don't definitely. I can always <laughs> tell. I can always tell. Have so here started... am I coming back to America. After yeah, and that's all what we're going to talk about. Crazy. Yeah, yeah well, look, there's been, a, there's been a lot of um, false starts and attempts. I mean, look, I had I was ripped off by management, um, you know, two or three times. And it always was difficult. I mean, after living in America, you know, living in Los Angeles, during the time I made all those 70s and early 80s, late 70s and early 80s records, um, I wasn't in the best shape financially, but I was still managing to come back. But the problem was that the manager that I had at the time, who's since died now, he took on a partner whose whole aim was to take me to Vegas. Because, you know, in those days, Vegas wasn't like it is now where it's gone rock and roll. But it was right. very much the the territory of, well, Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck, who he'd taken there before. So right. he wanted me to follow in there, you know, being a gregarious kind of outspoken, I don't know, um, sort of entertainer. Uh, you know, being larger than life, I was perfect for Vegas. So I suppose the last major gigs that I did there were, strangely enough, with Bill Cosby. And we were dual headlining together. I mean, Bill was a great guy. Let's not, um, you know, I mean, I know all of the things that went on uh, with Bill, but at the same time, when I was working with him, it was great. So I was able to do my show and Bill did his show and we would dual headline the Las Vegas Hilton, you know, where El the same stage where Elvis played and they put me up in the Elvis suite upstairs. And, you know, it was all crazy times, but I wanted to get back into rock and I wanted to, you know, I mean, I, I was making the records that were rock, but the, the genre that I was in was taking me away from the market, you know, so it was it was very hard. So it then became the journey to try and get back to that. But of course, when you don't have, you know, I got ripped off and uh, when I finished with these guys and I didn't really have much money. So it was very hard to get it back together. And I think the last time I played was maybe 30 years ago in the 90s when I was invited to come to Asbury Park. And do a show with Frankie Valley and um, and and Casey and the Sunshine Band, Howie and the guys, and you know we we did this big all star show that that came out on a video, um, a DVD uh, for for PBS, um, and um, you know basically never got paid for it, of course, of but course. came over and did that. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and 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 it was some cowboy putting on the gig, you know. We we're staying. We, it was in As Asbury Park, New Jersey, in the big music hall, you know, where Br Springsteen famously um, um, sung, you know, um, "Happy Christmas," the, yeah. the Christmas song, you know. Yeah, right, right. And 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 it was kind of I don't know. It was it was lovely to be back, but I knew that I would have to work hard to to really sort of like make a presence back in the states and. And finally, here we are. You know, I, I did a deal with Primary Wave um, over my past catalog, uh, and we share it together. And they've kind of really sort of done a great job in getting me back out here again. So now with an agent and, and, and you know, some gigs to do. And so this is this first bit is a real sort of, I don't know, sort of toe in the water. You know, we've got the rock and romance cruise that we're doing out of Miami uh, to start it all off, which I've done before. Um, and and uh, and then we, you know, we supplemented it with a, with two or three other gigs. So it's the idea of let's see how we all work together and let's see how it goes. And 
And then I think we've got a big tour coming in the fall. I mean, already uh, they're, they're starting to make bookings. And and so we should be over and playing New York and playing L.A. and playing everywhere, Boston, the whole lot, you know, Midwest, um, hopefully by the end of the year. So so I'm back. <laughs> we want you back, especially in New York. Mm, I mean, mm. For anybody who grew up in the in the 70s, I mean, your yeah. songs were, you know, a part of the soundtrack of our lives. Oh, thank you so much. I remember buying uh, long, tall uh, glasses um, yeah. when I was 13 in 1974 and just playing that song over and over again on the 45 <laughs> record. I know. It's it's extraordinary how long ago it is, but I can only tell you that um, I'm still performing much the same. My energies don't seem to have um, dissipated and my voice is still good. So, so you know, we just did a 50th anniversary tour in the UK last year and it went down so well and the gigs were great and the audiences were huge and i think that spurred us on to you know this attack now to to the states i mean i've got a three-year visa so you know it's a three-year plan and hopefully that will extend 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 um and i'm determined to come back you know so you're going to be sticking around in the states for a while doing a lot of sure sure i mean i'll be coming and going i'm still living in australia the band are all in england they all live in england um, I've got a button. I've got another band down here, but it was more practical to use the English guys, you know, so, so, uh, we're all meeting on the 15th, um, in Miami and we jump on the boat and, um, and we get going, you know, and looking for everybody's really looking forward to it. Are these guys have been playing with you for a long time? They know? have, yeah. About about, I mean, Elliot, the drummer, has been with me five, six years, um, and and uh, the rest of them, you know, pretty much the same time. And we're a really well oiled unit now. We actually may we've been making a DVD of the last show that we just waiting for the guys to finish it off. But then I think that's going to be available as a DVD. So we were live in Liverpool. Uh, in at the end of November, and um, we we filmed and, and and recorded it, and it's it's great. It's a nice product, you know. Wow, we can't wait to see it. So we're pretty so, glued together as a band, yeah. you know. Well, you've always had great musicians. I mean, on your recordings, and mm, you mm. know, looking looking back at uh, the Endless Flight album, I mean, you had some incredible musicians on there. You had I mean, it was Steve it Gag. was the joy of yeah. Well, it was the joy of being a solo artist, you know. And when I came to meet. Um, you know, I wasn't hassled, you know, with a band uh, yeah. kind of thing ever in my, I mean, I changed bands. God, I've played with so many different musicians. So I, I always managed to find good musicians, even right from the start, you know, at the class that I was playing. Um, and when I came to meet uh, Richard Perry, he said, well, I'm going to get the A-team on this. I didn't know what he was talking about. But when I walked into the studio and saw, by God, you know, Jeff Beccaro and, and, and Larry Carlton and yeah. Ralph McDonald on congas and, and, and May, Stevie Wonder's backing vocalists, you know, all there for me. I was going, this is it. I've landed, you know, yeah. Willie Weeks on bass. And, um, you know, it, it was it was just an incredible. And that grew, you know, as the as the recordings went. I mean, Richard just managed to everybody was keen to not only work for him, but work with me. The word went around, you know, that there's a buzz going, there's, here's another guy with a great voice and, and um, you should do this session. So, you know, Ray Parker Jr. who was on there right from the start, you know, was telling all of his friends, you've got to play with Leo, you know? So by the time it came to the finish of recording Endless Flight in 1976, and we were going to go on the road, Look at the band I had, Reggie McBride on bass, you know, who was with Stevie, who played on, you know, just about every great record, Superstition and all of those yeah. records with with Steve. Yeah. You know, Steve's playing drums, but Reggie's the bass player. That's and, called, um, that's called Nikki, A-list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nicky Hopkins on keyboards, you know, from the Stones. Um, Legend. And, and, yeah. and Bobby Keys um, on sax, you know, Steve Madeo, who wrote the, the chart for Seduke amongst them on trumpet, you know, and... And just marvelous musicians all the way. Alvin, Alvin Taylor on drums, who was Bill Withers' drummer, you know. So we and 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 I think the novelty as well of being a, an English white soul singer, you know, with a, a nearly all black band as well, was was something pretty special. And we took that, you know, to the clubs. Um, we played. I played the bottom line and the troubadour before, but uh, but we took we we went back to the bottom line and. Um, and I think we played the Roxy in LA and, you know, and, and, oh, just, 
it all it all grew until we played Central Park in New York and you know the uh, and 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 places like that and the Greek theater and, and and you know it it just grew and grew and and I think that those albums with Richard really cemented me in America although I'd had the hits before you know yeah he was a big producer he worked with a lot of different people yeah I mean, absolutely he had worked with Tiny Tim um D- and, yeah Donna Ross and, and yeah and, yeah and, 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 and Carly Stoneman, Simon and Barbara Fats, Streisand you know that's Domino right um yeah Harry Nielsen, Nielsen. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I mean well I, I think it is you know musicians love to love to, to work behind great singers and and great singers yeah, love yeah, to work with great yeah. musicians well, I mean, Jeff Picaro and I really forged a fantastic partnership. I mean, it went into four or five albums. Uh, you know, after I'd left Richard, um, he was still around and, and we were playing together and we were great friends. So, you know, there was an intensity there. If I could afford it, I would have taken him on the road, you know, and he would have gladly come because we were great mates. And there was even a time when Toto was starting that they got me to sing for them, you know. So there was always a... Uh, uh, an off chance that I might have become Toto's singer, but Bobby Kimball was was more available than I was. I was locked into a contract with Warner's, and it was it would have right. been difficult to do two jobs. But um, but I love singing with all the boys, Dave Page and Lukather, and you know Lukather as well was was on quite a few records that I made. You know, so so the guys kind of Dave Hungate as well. You know, they they were they were all around in a, a, a lot of the records I made. I even tried to write songs with Dave Page, and you know, so. That was my team. That was my my boys. You know, we had this relationship that was very close. And and, and creating number one singles. Mm. You had two in a yeah. row right? uh, off the yeah. uh, the album, and and then a third. I think we hit number two. More more. Yeah, than... with how much love? Yeah, yeah, yeah how much love? Yeah. That's right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the so, uh, when I need you came in a box of tapes. It was Albert Hammond and Carol Bayer Sager's song. Carol writing the lyrics, Albert writing the music. Um, and I just heard this song and I just wanted to record it. Richard wasn't so keen at the time because I think we were looking for more up-tempo stuff, but we we recorded it and, you know, that was a great success. And You Make Me Feel Like Dancing came from a jam that was kind of, you know, in between takes for doing that song, funnily enough, and the the boys and I were just always restless and... Richard was pedantic, you know, always wanted everything to be perfect. And so there'd be a moment when they'd be changing the reels of tape and we'd just, hey, guys, come on. Did you hear that thing on the radio this morning? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we'd just kind of <laughs> yeah. start jamming Ray Parker Jr. on guitar and Jeff on drums and Willie on bass and me singing. You know, we'd, we were unstoppable. I mean, Richard kind of had to, hey, guys, guys, come on, come on, come on. Let's get back to work. <laughs> but but little did we know that one of those little jams between the recordings for when I need you, he actually taped. He said, and in the in the control room, apparently it was throw the tape back on, record this now. You know, so um uh it, it was about two weeks later, then he played it back. He said, Now that's your hit. And he knew, he knew that a crossover song. You, which you make me feel like dancing was, yeah. You know, rather like Lowdown had been for 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 Boz Skaggs yes, before yeah. that. You know, with the same with a lot of the same musicians, a lot of the same you guys, know? yeah, yeah, a lot of the same guys. So he knew that that was the way that was something that could be achieved. I mean, we had friends with Motown, uh, you know, their pluggers, their record pluggers. I mean, he he took it to them. He didn't tell them I was white. In fact, they they, they actual they actually thought I was a black artist at first off and. The thing just raced up the, you know, first you got to get through to through, through to the 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 pluggers and the and the record pushers and the and the radio stations. It just raced. It raced up the charts. I think it was the fastest number one that year. You know, in in bullets, the way it moved up the charts and, and that, um, became that's what, a huge success. Seventy seven, right? Seventy seven, yeah. That, I mean, on the cusp like of seventy seven because it was actually released. I think October. around Christmas '76, oh, right, and it it then kind of peaked uh, in January. Yeah, there was a lot of competition that year too, which makes it even more special. I mean, you had Fleetwood Mac rumors. Yeah, out. I had... found that out later when we went to the Grammys because "When I Need You" was the second single was up for Song of the Year, and I think we got beaten out by James Taylor or someone like that. But man, the competition was fierce. I mean. When you're making a record, you're in a bubble. You don't yeah. really think about anybody else, you know. And and um, it was a, the amazing thing was that you make me feel like dancing. 
with me and Vinnie Poncia writing it, uh, uh, got the Grammy actually for for best you know best R and B song. Um, no. So that was pretty good. That was pretty cool. But we all thought that we were in with a shout for song of the year, you know, yeah. and uh, narrowly missed it. Came second or something like that, you know. I mean, the Eagles released Hotel California that year too. Shit. I mean, and <laughs> Rumors was yeah. was also Rumors. you know the toast yeah. of the Grammys. I mean, Fleetwood yeah. Mac every. You know, there were six singles off that record already. So, you know, how could you do how could you compete with that? You know? Yeah, I think Andy Gibb had a big hit too that that year. I just that's right. Yeah, you should have been dancing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the Bee Gees yeah. as well were still plugging stuff. And you know, Saturday Night Fever came out a little bit after that. So uh, that was 78 or so, but but it was it was um no, it was incredibly competitive and wonderful to be. Uh, you know, in LA, living in LA at that time. I mean, going to Tower Records and living in Laurel Canyon, me and my wife, Janice, my ex-wife, um, you know, really, we became Americans. You know, we we really embraced the whole thing from from uh, <laughs> tacos yeah. to the beach, you know. It was all there. It was just great. And, it was, and touring then with this incredible band, which I told you about, you know, and and just seeing the look on people's faces, you know, so as you were nailing every gig, it was it was that was incredible. And that's that's something I still love to do. I still love to surprise people. You know, they they think that you can make records. OK, but they don't realize what you do on stage. And and the stage part is very, very much part and parcel of what I do. You know. Right. You work in the room. You're an entertainer. You, you know. It's... Yeah. People I remember are... Bruce Springsteen coming to see me and saying, so you make records too, <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah, no. which was a nice compliment coming from Bruce because his sure. thing is the live thing as well, you know, and and we we were friends for a while and we shared that thing where, you know, the live gig was so important. Um, it was the crux of what you do. And then, then you just take that into the studio, you know, you write song. I mean, Bruce and I were both writing songs to play live. So we were making sure we had, you know, Long Tall Glasses was made to have a great song on stage, you know, and yeah. and and then you make a recording of it. And and but, you know, the main thing is it's it's great material to have on stage. And I always wrote songs if I could, you know, to to flesh out the live show. I mean, Thunder in My Heart, which was a big number one in the UK, is always the opener of the show. You know, it, it opens with such a bang. It's it's undeniable, you know. So so they become material vehicles, you know, for you to to show you what you do. Right. I think you know any working musician, I mean, the goal is always you want to get the people off their feet, you know, onto their feet. Absolutely, their absolutely. And and, and I think you this. sell your and you sell your career out on stage. I think I think you know. I mean, although I do respect, you know, there are a lot of artists that really like Christopher Cross, Stephen Bishop, who really uh, Andrew Gold, who. Their real cream is in making records. You know, that's their skills. Harry Nilsson, you know, hardly ever did a live show. I think I think I saw one in London and he was hiding behind the piano. You know, I mean, so Tim Hardin, you know, some of the great artists, even Leonard Cohen was kind of early on very uncomfortable on stage. You know, Bob Dylan, look at that. He still is reticent to talk to the audience, isn't he? He's getting on with what he's doing, but he's not a he's not a great communicator in that way. Well, I think it's a part of, I mean, just speaking with you right now, I can mm. see your personality. I mean, I think your stage yeah. presence is just an expansion of probably your personality too. You it see. is, it is. And and I think if you've got that thing, then you show it, you know, you don't hide it. <laughs> That's right, right. And, uh, you know, if you're an outgoing person, once you hit the stage, you become, I mean, now it's, okay, now it's live. Now it's even more outgoing. Now it's time yeah. to turn yeah. the people on, man. Well, I think I think we always we always love those people like Bruce. I mean, like Ed Sheeran is now. I mean, he's amazing on stage. You know, his personality is huge. And that's the reason he's got this success at the moment. You know, and I think I think that's it. He's not shy and coming forward. He just comes out. He pushes himself like mad, you know, and um, and I think that those kind of things are important. I'm, I'm not not so much a fan of Harry Styles, but I can understand that. You know what he does from what I've seen in concert. He takes over the whole stage, and that's what you do. And and that's very much in the mold of what people like me and Eddie Money and 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 you know and and Casey and the Sunshine Band and you know we're always trying to do be larger than life. And I think that's what people want you to be. Of course, but but you know I was listening to the album that you put out recently called Northern Songs. 
Mm. And that is brilliant. Thank you. I mean, that oh, is, thank you. Well, it's wonderful to hear oh, you. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Yeah, I mean, listen, we all know those Beatles songs. We've heard them millions of times. Mm, mm, mm. So it's it's like what jazz artists do. You know, jazz artists will take a record, like yeah. listening to Chick Corea do Autumn Leaves. I try oh, to God, find yeah, the song in absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, you know? yeah. Listen to Keith Jarrett's playing his standards, you know, and it's just takes it to a completely new place and yet reveres the original. I mean, when Keith plays Bach, he plays Bach, but he adds something of himself to it, you know. That's right. And and like what you did with Can't Buy Me Love, how you slowed it down. Oh, thank you. Thank you're you. You're adding yeah. the chord changes. You're altering chords. Well, I mean, look, I mean, I grew up, I love those songs. Uh, they all part of my life. And we had COVID. So, I mean, I just settled down to make an album and I thought, Instead of, because I've been, you know, I made an album a few years ago, Selfie, and another one, Restless Years, and they're all my songs. Some some songs are also written with Albert Hammond in there. Um, and I, this time I thought, well, why don't you just do the Beatles? But I don't like those kind of karaoke type tribute albums where everybody sings it exactly the same as the original. I mean, how can you compare what you do to the Beatles? They They nailed it. You know, you can't do it exactly the same. So I thought I'd experiment and... I was very nervous at first. I mean, I played it to a few people. There's a few eminent uh, uh, DJs and, and and music writers down here. And I tested it out on them. And they all said, oh, just release it. You know, I, I, and I said, OK, do you think I'll get away with it? And I t I'll tell you what the proof of the pudding was. I played in Liverpool live and I did two of the songs from the album. You know, we did Eleanor Rigby, which is very much in a Jackson, in a, in a, in a Michael Jackson style, you know. Don, 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 don. And we played um, uh, uh, Across the Universe. And the audience was just incredible. I mean, they even stood up, gave me a standing ovation at the end of these two songs. So I thought, well, if I can crack that in Liverpool, I can crack that anyway. <laughs> you know, it was it was kind of. I don't know if there was forgiveness yeah. in the room or there there was there was kind of, um, you know, support. I don't know what it was, but it was but they loved it anyway. So. That That's great. basically what it was. They they loved what you were doing. You know? Yeah, it passed muster with them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, if it's genuine, you know, I think. Uh, with, I with think so, music, yeah. If, if it's, yeah, if it's and I mean, I always covered songs. I mean, I covered Raining in My Heart because I adored Buddy Holly. Um, you know, there were great songs of mine that were hits like Have You Ever Been In Love and Can't Stop Loving You and When I Need You that I just interpreted and always tried to interpret as if I'd written the song myself. So... That's what you try and do. I mean, I sang um, Heart Stop Beating in Time, which was a Bee Gees song that Dionne Warwick had recorded. And I put my heart and soul into that one and everybody seemed to like that, you know. So I, I think sometimes, you know, you do covers, of course. Um, you you cover great songs. I mean, I did the, I, I'd, I'd recorded the Beatles before and done very faithful versions. And I had a, a Christmas uh, um, uh uh, single of Let It Be, you know, that I'd, I'd recorded. And we still play that sometimes on stage, you know. Um, and, and you know, you just get to it. You, you adore these songs. I mean, one day I suppose I'll attack Bob Dylan and, 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 and Leonard Cohen and Paul Simon and do versions of those, I suppose, as well. But, um, but you know, you've got to, I think you've got to stray from the original. You've got to make it yours, you know. You've got to do it your way. Because it makes it interesting for the listener. I think so. And I think people like Bruce, they do that as well. You know, they, they, you know, you better watch out. You, better, yeah. you know, I mean, he does it. It's Bruce still, isn't it? I mean, it could be a Bruce song, but he's taking something else. And yeah, that's right. He, he does his own little story before the song. He oh, I love it. I love it. Way. Yeah. He made it his. And do you, do there you, you think go. That because you're a songwriter, that that creativity you have as a songwriter jumps over into the whole cover scene absolutely totally i mean i mean you you deal with it just like you you know you break the song down just like you if it was one of your own you know and i think that that the songwriter takes a different approach yeah definitely than than the singer you know so there's always that i mean okay there's the singer where i've got to kind of be fair and 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 respect the original but the songwriter in me really hmm, what about if we did that chord shape there or that inversion or maybe if we held on for two bars on that note you know and and so you're always kind of rearranging something you can't help it it's part of the animal you know part of, part of being creative mm. um i mean you've written a lot of songs are there any particular 
uh, versions of your songs that you've loved, other people, other artists have done? Uh, well, you know, straight at the start of my career, Roger Daltrey was singing uh, a bunch of David Courtney's and my songs, you know, and literally we just started. I mean, David discovered me and and we'd started writing and we were at the studio that Roger had, his home studio. We were kind of in awe of being there. And, and he just turned around and said, you should give me some of these songs. So we did. And he sang Giving It All Away and I... Just a boy, and I think that his still his version is mighty, you know, of that beautiful, you know, the what what He's he did. A powerful singer. You know. I mean, on the other side, you got Three Dog Night, who did the show must go on, and kind of missed the point because I'm singing, I won't let the show go on, and they were singing, we must let the show go. They even changed the words, you know. So yeah. I went, oh, don't, you don't get it, you know. And respect to them, they made a great record, and of course, it was a hit, um, and it was the first American hit, really, for me, you know, of my songs. I didn't appreciate it at the time. I just was angry, you know, kind of how dare they take my song. And, yeah. But um, but mm. but no, I mean they're 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 all viable things. And then Dolly Parton and Tina Turner have all sung Phil Collins, you know, they've all sung uh, the songs that I've recorded or, or written. And um it's it's an honor, you know, to to see those things happening, you know. You know, you've you've have continually pretty much recorded and released new music for the past 50 years. And there are some albums that I've been listening to. Some mm -hmm. of them weren't released in the U S um, no, that's right. Well, that was, that was part of the business problems that we had, you know, couldn't, I was off Warner brothers by this time. And, uh, you know, you, you get to a point really where, uh, there's, it's very hard to pick up when you've, when you've, you know, we've got moved on to Rhino, you know, with all the, you know, the past catalog going on yeah. to Rhino Warner brothers cut out, um, album, thing and i said to them look i've still got new music can you give it to you and they said sure but every time i called them about that they said nah, no we're still concentrating on selling your old stuff you know so that's what they were about and i realized i didn't have a label a label but luckily i've had a label in england called demon records and yeah. i've stuck with them and now we've actually got the arrangement where they can distribute in america so so finally we are through that so i think you should see some more of those past releases um, coming out now, you know, they'll, like cool they'll, they'll drip slowly, but surely into the market. Yeah. They'll be available. You'll find them in the record stores. That's, that's our next main aim is to get those, um, the whole catalog the in the stores. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I listened to an album like cool touch and great, you know, some of the songs like young and in love, and they, oh, they sound you. like number one hit singles to me. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's just, I'm, I'm writing with Alan Tarney was also a joy. I mean, we, we did Orchard Road, another song that's never been released there. And of course, all the Living in a Fantasy album, which had more than I can say, was the main thing people picked out of that. But of course, there was good, good, great songs in there as well, you know. Um, and and he's a joy to work with because he's a one man machine, rather like me. I mean, he's influenced me into what I'm doing now. I mean, as I look around the studio, this is a one man studio. I mean, I I make everything myself now and and quite actually actually i'm really looking forward to the next album of having some musicians on it for a change because it takes me a lot of time to make these records that's the thing sure what are you using like pro tools or logic or something like that logic yeah and yeah. and then but i have a great pro tools engineer who helps me finish everything off a guy called john hudson who recorded okay. all the tina turner records and the brian adams records and mixed them and um you know has grammys and everything himself but he uh he basically is an amazing guy to work with. So I, I know that at the end of the day, whatever I'm doing here, I've got him to bounce off and, and yeah. we bounce off each other during the whole process. So but that's, you know that. you're not completely alone, you know? It's like, I find if, if sometimes you can write a song and then you hand it to a group of musicians and the bass player will just play something that you never expected them to play. And it can totally. take the song somewhere else. It can do. And yet on the other side, I mean, I think I've wanted to seize back control in some ways because i've had so many bass players who say no you can't play it like that and yet i can play that on the keyboard and it actually works so you know bye bye thank you i'll carry on you know? <laughs> so no, no but you know what i mean it's like yeah. sometimes you find you find a way i love working out the mechanics of i mean i'm not a drummer i'm not a natural musician but i love working out the mechanics of how the hell am i going to do that okay this symbol goes before that and the beat is here and you know, I love the, I love the challenge. It's a bit like, I mean, my dad used to try and invent things 
he, he was a miserable adventure uh, inventor, <laughs> but he was a great engineer. And I think that I've got his mind, you know, in me that loves to cut things up, separate things. I mean, I can listen to a record and I can actually concentrate on what the bass is doing or the guitar's doing and separate those parts. And I've got that ear that can do that. So that's been my main tool in this, you know, learning how to separate the items, you know, literally, okay, today we're going to do the bass, you know, and um, you go in and it might take four days, but you know, every single note you're working on. Right. Okay. Next we're going to do the guitar. So you can actually kind of build a framework and, and that's very hard because most of us, we hear a completed record, especially these days. Now we've been sport with MTV. We've been spoiled with kind of like CD and digital and everything. And we, and we've been sport with hearing records that are kind of almost ready mixed. Um, right. So it's very hard to construct things, you know, with that in your head, you can hear the finished item and you've got to be patient and build towards it. Right. You know what? I'm looking at the time and I realize that I got to go to another interview. Isn't that terrible? It is terrible. <laughs> they pack them in. But look, let's do this again, mate. Yeah, I really know.